Last session, we stopped here with Electra. And Electra, unlike uh, BERT and GPT type of models, which were generative, is a discriminative model. And it's based on the ideas that we are going to keep seeing uh, in the next few sessions when it comes to uh, adversarial neural networks, generative adversarial neural networks, where you have a discriminator discriminating between real and fake. And uh, the message there was that, yes, a discriminative approach is going to work. At the same time, it's going to end up being more efficient when it comes to the number of flops that you're going to use to pre-train your model. And uh, we also learned about sentence BERT last session. The idea of sentence BERT is that many people thought that the representations that are going to come out of BERT, we can actually use them. We can take a sentence, vectorize it using BERT, and then use it in some downstream tasks. We can use BERT as a feature extractor. But it actually ends up not being such a great feature extractor on its own. It's even doing worse than a glove or the average of glove vectors. And it's not good at uh, unsupervised tasks like clustering. If you take a sentence or your entire data set, which is a set of sentences, vectorize all of them, and then try to visualize your vectors or cluster them together, it is actually not such a great clustering algorithm. It's not going to give you good clusters. So these are not good feature extractors. And we try to improve upon it using this uh, Siam C architecture. You have two sentences, you encode them, and then you use uh, a natural inference data set to fine tune these representations, and then you can fix those representations to end up being good representations in general. And there is a reason for BERT not being a good uh, feature extractor is that its pre-trained pre -training objective function is to find the words or unmask the words that are masked. So that is what it is trying to do. It is not trying to say this sentence is different from another sentence. But by fine tuning it on a natural inference task, you're gonna be able to get better representations out of BERT. What we are going to be doing today is along the same lines with SIM CSE. I'm going through this paper for a couple of reasons, because later on we are going to learn about contrastive learning, and we're going to apply that to images. So it's a good idea to learn about contrastive learning as a general framework that you can actually use it for text as well, or even speech. At the same time, it is about fixing the representations that are going to come out of BERT and make them better sentence embeddings. What does uh, SIM CSE stand for? It stands for a simple contrastive sentence embedding framework. Don't worry about this figure yet. I'm going to break it apart. I'm going to explain the unsupervised SIM CSE, and I'm going to leave this as an exercise to learn about supervised from the paper. But what is contrastive learning? What are you trying to do? You have a data set of paired images, paired text, paired speech. So you have a data set of paired examples. How are you going to pair them? You can say that X and X plus are somehow semantically related. When it comes to images, it could be that one image is a rotation of the other image or one image is an augmented version of the other image. Maybe you played around with the saturation or the contrast of your image. Or maybe one image is a crop of the other image. As for images, for text, it could be that one sentence is a reshuffling of the other sentence. Or one sentence is a masked version of the other sentence when one word is removed. So you can play around with a lot of data augmentation techniques here. Same thing for a speech. You can actually remove portions of the speech and mask them out. We're going to learn about data augmentation techniques for speech later on. But whatever that you do, these two data points are going to end up being paired. They're going to be semantically related. That's what contrastive learning is doing. Then you take those two pairs, you push them through the same architecture, and that's going to give you two hidden representations. And this could just be your BERT 
or Roberta model. You take two sentences, you push them through your uh, BERT architecture, and then it's going to give you uh, two vectors or a sequence of vectors that you can average them out and turn them into a single vector. Or you can look at the uh, vector right on top of the classification token or CLS token at the beginning of your sentences. What else? This is actually the contrastive loss. You have two vectors. You look at the cosine similarity between those two vectors. We learned about temperature, so there is nothing special here. And then the rest of it is softmax. It's the log of your softmax is actually the negative of the log of your softmax. But what is this objective function trying to do? It is trying to make the representation of xi, which is hi, and the representation of xi plus, which is hi plus, more similar to each other. So it's trying to make those two representations close to each other while making the representation of one of those images and the other images in your mini batch. So n is actually a mini batch size different. So it is trying to make the representations of semantically related paired examples to be close to each other and the other ones to be further away. And that's what this objective is trying to do. And what is cosine similarity of two vectors? You create a dot product and then you divide by the norm of the two. And your H is going to come out of a pre-trained Bert or Roberta because you want to fix the representations that are coming out of Bert and Roberta to be more discriminative. I'm going to stop here and try to see if you have any questions about contrastive learning in general. Okay, was everything clear about contrastive learning? Okay, perfect. We are going to keep revisiting contrastive learning in the future. What is this unsupervised sim CSE doing then? You have a collection of sentences. Now, a fundamental question is how do you actually come up with these pair of semantically related examples? And it's actually a literature on its own. How do you actually do data augmentation? This, the idea here is very simple. Your XI plus is actually your XI. So basically, you don't do any data augmentation. They are actually the same images, the same sentences. But what you change is you play around with dropout. What are you doing? You have your transformer architecture. That transformer has some standard dropout. For instance, you are dropping out your fully connected layers as well as your attention probabilities. And the default dropout probability was 0.1. And how are we going to use dropout? You take example xi, you push it through a neural network, but then uh, the representation that's going to come out of that neural network is going to be hi, and it's going to be different from the representation for xi+. plus. So hi and hi+, plus are going to end up being different because of the dropout because once you're processing XI, some hidden units dropped. And while you were processing XI plus, some other uh, units dropped. And therefore, in the end, you have two different representations, despite the fact that those two data points are exactly the same. Okay, perfect. So you don't do anything. It's just drop out doing its job, giving you HI and HI plus. And that's all you needed. You have XI, you have a different Z, uh, which is going to represent the random masking for your dropout. And alternatively, you could take X and you can do some random discrete operation on it. For instance, masking some portions of your text or reshuffling. We are not going to be doing this, but it's just for comparison purposes. In the end, you have two different H. You can look at the similarity between the two, and then you can write down your contrastive loss. So this formula is exactly what you have here. The only difference is that xi is exactly xi plus. And hi and hi uh, plus are going to end up being different because of the dropout. OK, perfect. Now let us study the effect of not doing any uh, data augmentation, which is just setting xi plus to be equal to xi. It's going to give you the best performance on semantic textual similarity task, semantic textual similarity benchmark. And it's even doing better than having a G here, which is data augmentation. And you can have all sorts of data augmentation, cropping a portion of your text, delete a portion of your 
uh, text. Maybe 10% 10, 10 of the words you just delete. Delete one word, read or read out dropout in the architecture, replace the synonyms or pick a word and replace it with its synonym and the type of mask language model uh, masking strategies that we are using for BERT. And this is a strong indication that dropout is doing a good job at giving you different representations, HI and HI plus, and then you can compare the two. Without dropout, without this uh, data augmentation, if you try to maximize this, HI and HI plus are gonna end up being equal, and then your model is gonna collapse. There's not gonna be any learning. So it is crucial for HI and HI plus to end up being different one way or another, either through data augmentation or through dropout or through having different architectures. Any questions about unsupervised SIMCSE up until this point? Was everything clear? Perfect. Now let's try to understand what is actually happening when you try to optimize this loss function. And to be able to do so, you're gonna look at two metrics. One of the metrics is if I keep sampling pairs of positively related uh, X and X pluses and look at that expectation. How close are the representations that are gonna come out? So you can take X, push it through your neural network. It's gonna give you a vectorized version of X. You can take X plus, push it through your neural network, get the vectorized representation. How close are they? And that's going to give you L line. It is this axis of this figure. The other axis is how spread is your data? How uniformly spread is your data going to end up being after you featureize them, after you extract the features through your architecture? And that this other axis. We are starting with a pre-trained BERT, and that one is going to already give us a good alignment between these features, it is this red star here. But then throughout training in an unsupervised fashion through this loss function contrastive learning, the other metric is gonna improve. So your data is now more uniformly spread. And then you can compare it to uh, different strategies. For instance, delete one word is gonna do the same thing, but it has a lower alignment. So these features are gonna end up being less aligned together. Or this orange one, is when you don't do any dropouts. Now it's actually a good time to go and look at this figure. Intuitively speaking, you have a sentence. You take that sentence, push it through your architecture with two different dropouts. You are gonna end up with two different representations. And then you can compare that example to itself. You want those two representations to be as close as possible to each other. And then you want the representation of this sentence to be very different from the representations of other sentences. So you're pulling similar sentences together and then different sentences, you're pushing them apart. And this is exactly what you have here. Similar sentences are gonna end up having similar vectors or close vectors. And the ones that are different, they're gonna be scattered in a uniform fashion in your space. For supervised case, what you have is you have pairs of data from a natural language inference task. Are these two sentences uh, contradiction to each other? Are they neutral? Are they entailment? And then out of entailment and contradiction, you can end up with your positive cases. For instance, two dogs are running. It should be close to uh, there are animals outdoor, but it should be very different. This is a negative example. The pets are sitting on the couch and it should be different from other random sentences from your corpus. And this is how you're gonna actually supervise it. It is supervised because you know your labels and you're using natural language inference type of data. And we were doing the same thing when we were, we were using the same type of data when we were doing sentence BERT. So what is the message here? You cannot take a BERT or Roberta model and expect that the vectors that are gonna come out of them to be good feature representations for your sentences. You actually need to do some work afterwards. And then perhaps you can cluster your data, perhaps you can do uh, some visualizations of your data. Are these sentences falling close to each other? Are they falling uh, 
in different buckets, and we can do all sorts of interesting things. Any questions about SIM CSE and contrastive learning in general? Okay, perfect. In that case, we can move on. 